The remnants of Japan's bubble era are now spread across oceans, on different continents, spoken to and sworn at in different languages, being maintained, cared for, modified, and enthusiastic grey market communities all over the world. The 90s hit Japan with a knockout punch, but it took a few years for the auto manufacturers to wind down their ludicrous projects, clear out parts and inventory, and settle into the mundane new millennium of production. The AZ-1 is one of the most interesting bubble era cars. In the late 80s, Mazda was doing bold things, and the AutoZam AZ-1, a love child they shared with Suzuki, was one of the most recognizable of the era. It was an almost immediate commercial flop, launched with direct competition from Suzuki in the form of a cappuccino and Honda's Beat, the trio were referred to as the ABCs of K sports cars. Of the trio, Mazda's car had the lowest production numbers and shortest production run. Compared to other types of cars, Japan's K-Class is perhaps the most uniquely JDM with its dimensions, weight, power, and displacement restrictions. A Mitsubishi Delica can go anywhere in the world and almost keep up with traffic, but you can still go to the car store in Japan and buy a car that doesn't keep pace on a western highway without melting itself. And of this uniquely JDM class of cars, the AZ-1 is the most iconic. People will say it looks like a Fiero or a DeLorean, and while everybody is entitled to their own opinion, these comparisons were of way higher production, more accessible cars in the West, making the AZ-1 more uniquely obscure both in North America and globally. When these AZ-1s get featured on channels in North America like Leno's Garage, RCR, or elsewhere, it seems important to every other presenter to point out that it's small and hard to get into, or to film themselves rolling out of it onto their belly like a dying fish. You can figure this out though after a couple of less graceful tries. Compared to the rest of the car, the hole in the body opening the door creates is huge in proportion to the car. Look at it. Opening the door makes a hole as big as half the roof and a third of the body's length. Instead of describing it in terms relative to domestic market dimensions or comparisons, it should be considered larger than life, with extraordinarily low production numbers, and appreciated for the fact that engineers convinced Mazda they could produce a rear mid-engine, rear-wheel drive, go-wing, designed within K-class scale. Before the ABCs, urban use K cars in the early 90s occasionally had turbos, but they rarely had design features bolder than a hood scoop. When the ABCs came out, they were the K-Class supercars. Where's the engine? I think you might want to check the other end of the car. Oh! The Suzuki F6A is a three-cylinder intercooled turbo with electronic injection and four valves per cylinder, transverse mounted just over and mostly forward of the rear axles. Adhering to K restrictions, the car has under 64 horsepower and weighs 720 kilograms. The engine is easily accessible under the rear deck, but you can also get to the front of the engine through a large inspection port inside the cabin just behind the seats. The side draft fence on the rear quarters are functional and duct air into the engine bay. The intercooler is mounted just behind the driver's side vent. It isn't a motorcycle engine, but Redline is 9,000 RPM. Suzuki's F6A engine can be found in all kinds of cars, including the Cappuccino, the Cara, Alto, Carry, Jimny, and the K, to name a few Suzukis, as well as the Mazda Carol and an Arctic Cat T660 sled, to name a few outside of the Suzuki range. Over the course of my time with this car, I preemptively had a timing belt and water pump job done. Noticed that there was a lovely DIY catch can installed, which I replaced with a nice little Mishimoto that I mounted near the cabin bay access, powder coated the charge pipes and some other bits and pieces wound up rebuilding the brake master cylinder. And then my plans for the car kind of changed course. Did you see where that red AZ-1 went? I heard he, uh, I heard he broke down somewhere east of here. We had big plans and then he disappeared. I'm not from around here. You got a map? He should stand out. It's an unusual looking car. These cars are too small. It's like looking for a needle in a parking lot. Must have gone off the plot. Let's focus on cleaning this one up. Eventually, I decided the AZ-1s look better with a Mazda Speed wing, so I ordered one. To my eye, the 25-year-old single-stage paint was not looking fantastic. 
and there was no sense putting a shiny new wing on with the rest of the car looking so tired. So my friend Carphonics removed every panel from the car, and I trucked it all off to the paint shop for a fresh paint job before carefully reassembling. Looking at the naked structure is pretty interesting. For Mazda and Suzuki, this car was engineered from the ground up, unlike anything they had done previously, and designed with two things in mind, rigidity and gull wings. With the car naked, you get a good glimpse of the engineering that went into the gull wings, window and lock mechanisms, as well as the structure of the gunnels behind the skirt area and side impact material. At some point in the resto, I decided the cheap aftermarket wheels the car came all the way from Japan on sort of sucked. So I hunted down a set of black racing Watanabe style rims and had them coated in a neat, deep gray finish. When final assembly was complete, I decided the long OE whip antenna made the car look a bit too much like an RC car, so I replaced it with a little aftermarket one, and then went on to replace the speakers and head unit. The OE exhaust was removed and saved, and I installed a handmade AutoJewel three-piece stainless, which had a note louder and deeper than you'd ever expect from a 0.6 liter three-cylinder engine. All of this is to say that over a couple of years of ownership, I got to know the car pretty well. Driving an AZ1 is an interesting experience. It is fun to be in a sporty K car sitting just a few inches above the road surface. Because of the rear mid-engine, rear-wheel drive configuration and pretty decent power to weight ratio, cornering is fun, and the AZ1 does have enough power to break loose in tight quick turns. Acceleration and gear changes come quick, and the driver gets to hear lots of engine noise, turbo sounds, and exhaust notes. There is a ton of feedback from the road. This blue AZ1 had fairly stiff KYB suspension which was wonderful on smooth surfaces and well-paved roads and corners, but bumping along over train tracks or frost heave roads made for a really rough ride with the short, narrow wheelbase. The AZ-1 has no problem keeping up with city speed traffic. There's ample power to accelerate quickly or rush past traffic between stoplights. The Speedo goes up to 140 kilometers an hour. I never had mine over 120 but you can buy a 180 km per hour display to put into your OE cluster. The AZ-1 is a two-seater, but I mainly drove this car by myself. Adding a passenger does affect the car's performance noticeably. While throwing a passenger in there means you have a volunteer cup holder, the ride, power to weight ratio, acceleration and braking all change noticeably. Remember, a 720 kg car hauling a driver around is going to affect performance but double that load and there's going to be a proportional change. About the only thing you can do inside the AZ-1 is drive and enjoy. Put somebody else in the passenger seat and you're going to be rubbing shoulders on corners and brushing their thigh on gear changes. There isn't room for much else, and nowhere to set a coffee down. If it's a warm day, you'll want the AC working. The toll booth windows don't allow for a lot of circulation inside the car, but the AC works great cooling these cabins down fast. They are tiny after all. The color of your seats will depend on which color AZ-1 you have, and there were only two choices when Mazda originally launched the car. If you bought a red car, your seats were red, and if you bought a blue car, the seats were blue. The fixed buckets are reasonably comfortable on short trips, and offer the driver a good hug on cornering. One of the common flaws with the AZ-1s is the seat bolster foam tends to degrade over time, with wear giving the seats a saggy look, but the actual material is fairly sturdy, they don't recline. The driver's seat's on a short rail, but the passenger seat is bolted directly to the floor. It's interesting to watch reactions in this hemisphere to pricing. Mr. Regular seemed floored by the price of the AZ-1 he reviewed in 2017. Ten years ago, when I was packing up in Japan and preparing to move to Canada with a bunch of cars, I wanted to buy an AZ-1 but couldn't afford it. I wound up with a cappuccino then, which was a great decision and turned out to be a car I still miss but I'd always wanted to try an AZ-1. 
and they have always been just a bit more expensive than seems fair. As is the case with these things, whenever I revisited the idea of buying one, the price seemed just a bit higher. I did finally pull the trigger on this blue one in 2016 just as the US market was taking an interest. The fact is the AZ ones have always been expensive. In October 1992 when the cars first went on sale, they had an MSRP of 1,492,000 yen, or about 25 grand in current Canadian dollars with inflation, which was higher than either the Beat or the Cappuccino. The AZ1 had a fairly short-lived run from October 92 until May 94, and roughly 4,500 cars were produced. Sales were poor. Mazda had a large number of unsold cars, and they next tried dressing them up with kits like the M2 1015. Suzuki even took a shot at unloading the chassis with approximately 500 rebadged Karas. At the end of their era though, it was a sales flop with a lot of parallels to the Tellurian disaster from a decade earlier, minus the alleged cocaine entrapment. Compare the AZ1 to the competing Honda Beat, which had a production run north of 30,000 over 8 years. Or the Cappuccino, which went into a back-to-back -back second generation. Much like the DeLorean, AZ-1 appreciation found traction years after when production ceased and the supply dwindled. In Japan, you can pay as much as double the original MSRP for a low kilometer clean example, or a mint M2-1015 edition. So in answer to Mr. Regular's sticker shock, these cars have always been expensive, and they aren't ever getting cheaper. Practically speaking, the AZ-1 isn't all that practical. It's pretty fun, pretty cramped, isn't great on long trips, and is probably a bit of a coffin in an accident. There are bigger, faster, more comfortable cars. At their current prices, you can literally buy a whole lot more car for the same money. But for AZ-1 money on an AZ-1, you will own an incredibly unique piece of Japan's automotive history, a pinnacle of design outrageousness from an era acknowledged to be their best and most forward-thinking. They're golden years. And you know what? After selling my gorgeous blue one, I bought another to do it all over again. I owe a big thanks to Michael, Chase, and Justin for giving me a hand with some of the filming. Will, who let me film with his red car when it had just arrived. Leslie and Clayton for putting this car in a national newspaper. And my buddy Gatlin at Carphonics for helping with the restoration and letting it live in his shop. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the AZ-1.